Um, I'm Martin Burns. As you can maybe just faintly hear in my voice, uh, I do come from a small country up north a little bit. Um, for the best part of 10, 15 years, I worked for a very, very large blue company, um, working with uh, very large com com customers. So if I have a bias, that's it. Um, so if you're not in that situation, I do apologize, and I'm not meaning to say that, that your situation isn't entirely valid. This is very much from, from my experience. Um, when I was working for that, that uh, large company, I was a project manager, discovered Kanban, introduced Kanban into global, into global services, became a lean coach after that, and started to be, talk about um, A3 and Kata. Um, working for the Blue Corporation got a bit boring last year, so I left um, and decided life wasn't hard enough, so I moved to Sweden. Um, to a 400 odd person consultancy where I got to work with Mr. Lego himself, um, Hakon Forsch, who is absolutely uh, amazing to work with, and I'm really happy that the, the time there. Um, so, uh, what, what I do is I work as similarly with, with large organizations. Current customer, it's a product development system that has 1,400 engineers working on a single product flow. That's the kind of scale we're talking about. Um, do I, is what I do lean? Yeah, kind of. Is it agile? Yeah, kind of. Do I care which you call it? Not really. The most important thing is better. Um, I'm absolutely obsessive about better. So what's this, this talk about? Well, it's kind of focused on impediments, and we'll talk a little bit about what I mean um, in, in a little while. Um, using flow, using Katha, I thought that was going to be the whole talk until I started actually writing it and realized what it was actually about was culture and management systems and how all these things interrelate. But we're going to start with impediments. So, you have an end-to-end -end product flow, okay? And in that flow, you have an impediment and it works like a rock in a flow. It causes turbulence. And it kind of works a little bit like in traditional projects, unresolved dependencies, which cause delay. That's no surprise. Most problems in software development exhibit themselves as a delay. Am I allowed to cite Alan as a Kanban University <laughs> related thing? Don't know. I am anyway. I don't care. Um, fixing those takes time, takes focus, takes energy from the team. And you only have a certain amount of those, right? So while they're busy doing that, they're not working on the actual product. So that causes even more turbulence in your flow, which causes even more delay. <laughs> Clearly, this is not good stuff. So I kind of talked to, so, well, I mean, I know my experience, but I wanted to survey some other uh, opinions. So I talked to the, the people in my lean coffee group in, in Stockholm. Anybody that doesn't do lean coffee, I thoroughly recommend it. If you want to know how, talk to Chris McDermott. He is um, a guru in such things to, to my way of, of, of seeing it. And I got things like, well, when we resolve impediments, we go to our manager, who's too busy. So it sits with them for a while, and nothing happens. So we go to their manager, who's even busier, and it goes nowhere. Or we talk about impediments in retrospectives and assign owners, and that's all right, but it takes one iteration length or however frequently you're doing a retrospective to do anything about it. We debate it at the time, and they kind of float upwards to management when they become too painful. We don't really have a process, and it doesn't really work very well. Um, we have one impediments that reoccur across the organization all the time, access rights, and we have to keep fixing the same stuff. Now, those things do tend to get fixed quite quickly, but they keep happening. We don't prevent them. And the bigger stuff goes to retrospective, and the really big stuff has to go up to the CTO level, and that takes months. Hmm. Not good. Painful. Little side note. Just because you're seeing turbulence in your flow, yes, it might be an impediment, and that clearly is a bad thing. But the other thing you might be doing that causes impediments, you might be trying some stuff out. 
you might be experimenting. Thank you, from Dan, for setting up my talk so well. Um, and trying stuff out for the first time is always going to be a little bit painful, and that's going to cause more turbulence. But improvements, yeah, they cause them, but you want some of those. And maybe if you don't see any turbulence at all, are you actually trying to improve your system? I'll just leave that there to, 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 to focus on, for, to, to, for you to think of at a later point. But when you have an impediment, obviously, if you can fix it, then you should. Yeah? And there's a lot of good stuff that's happened within, within, within good empowering organizations that says, look, you can fix stuff. But sometimes you genuinely can't. It's not within your sphere of influence, or at least you don't perceive it's within your sphere of influence. So you ask for help. Dear Lord, we beseech thee. Please help my impediment. And the trouble is with some organisations that, have, that, have, that are taking on board the empowerment message is they overuse it. And whatever you, whenever you ask for help, the message comes back, you're empowered, fix it yourself. Yeah, if I could have done that, then I kind of would have. Which leaves you still there with your impediment. By the way, does, does everybody... It seems to become a standard. Pink sticky notes for impediments in visual management. I'm kind of using that throughout, so that's my visual cue. Um, so you're left there in the wasteland, and I, my animation doesn't, doesn't go uh, as far as tumbleweed, but you're there, I've still got this impediment, feeling, well, a little bit squashed. So, observation. Sometimes... You actually need your management, your leadership, to take part in this. Hmm. Particularly when you want to do it quickly. So, a couple of, couple of questions that, that make you, th you think about how well are we doing this. How, what's the average, and, and is Steve Tendon in... No, okay. Chris, I know you're going to be using this diagram later. Um, what's the average um, time that it takes from somebody identifying an impediment to doing something about it. Previously, we heard months in some, some cases. And as part of that, what's the average response time between you noticing something and somebody who can genuinely do something about it saying, all right, I'll take that one, in a way that you really you know, believe. So here's the Graham Norton bit. Everybody stand up. Okay, stay standing if in where you work or maybe your customer, but the thing you know what best, you work to resolve impediments. Excellent. Stay standing if your average lead time to resolve a tricky impediment is less than six months. So sit down if it's longer than six months. Okay. Stay standing if it's less than three months. One month. <laughs> one sprint, one iteration. <laughs> Two weeks. I'm below that. One week. Okay, the, um, what I have seen actually working is one day, fairly consistently. Well, maybe a day to get it to the notice of the person who has the power to do something about it, but that tends to be somebody who can actually do something, and it happens quite quickly. Okay, everybody up again. <laughs> In that organisation that you were thinking about, Sit down if you can think you can already reduce that lead time. Cool. Sit down if you'd like to reduce it. <laughs> Good, because anybody standing at this point, I was going to say, you're clearly in the wrong talk or the wrong conference and go away. <laughs> okay, so 
This is the bit where I'm particularly grateful to, to Dan, because for the next bit of the talk, we're going to do, stand back, I'm going to try, no, nope, nobody reads XKCD other than me. <laughs> Science! Can I try that again? Stand back, I'm going to try. Science. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so scientific method 101 for, for people that don't really understand science very well like me. Okay, so we start, let's start with an observation. Stuff is happening. Hmm, that's interesting. It's like the um, stick my fingers in the light bulb. Um, your average person says, ow, I won't do that again. A scientist says, I wonder if it would happen if I did it again. So you form a hypothesis that says there's something about that, and you, you then predict what would happen if I did it again, or try this. So you set up a situation to validate that prediction. Let's call it an experiment, which goes back around to your observation and says, is what we observe what we predicted? And you learn when the two aren't the same. And that then helps you improve your, your hypothesis. So scientific method in a very small nutshell. Any real scientist, feel free to kick the crap out of me later. So here's my hypothesis. Okay, we want to talk about rapidly resolving impediments, right? So, we already said impediments block product flow. So, what's the reverse of that? We remove the impediment, we improve the flow. Better removal, better flow. Hmm, here's the insight that, that drives the hypothesis. Impediment removal is a process which also has a flow. So if we manage to have a better flow of impediment resolution and removal, we will have better product flow. Now, it turns out flow is something we already know, and I hope most of the people here know a little bit about. Okay? Um, the next slide I'm literally going to run through at, at, at speed, but some of these ideas at least should be fairly... Um, you should have, chances are you'll have heard a good chunk of them before. So, when we're talking about improving flow, we're talking about smaller batches and more often. More often, well, there's an economic impact for that because you start saying, well, there's a cost to every batch we do. Hmm, okay, so you've got a U-shaped optimization curve going on about what's the ideal batch size to reduce the cost of delay while not killing yourself with with um, transaction costs. So reduce the transaction costs, you can reduce the, 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 um, the optimum uh, batch size. And we know also that if you really want to, to screw with flow, you make sure everybody is fully utilized at all time, they've got no time to, to pay attention to anything else. You know that you're going to have to constrain WIP to be able to, to have flow working best, you know that um, is going to make you want to prioritize which makes you choose what do we do first. If we can't do everything at the same time, we'll need to do some sequencing. And therefore, some kind of cadence is also going, going to help. So, we know a little about, um, uh, about improving flow already. Let's use some of that thinking to drive how we resolve impediments. Hmm. Here's a little insight I, I, I had literally yesterday when I was, I was thinking about this today. When we're talking about flow, flow is a system effect. Who owns systems? Who owns a system? Mm, uh, lots of people work in systems. The people who own systems are management. It's a reserved role. Creating no direct value, the only thing it can do usefully is create, sustain, help the improvement of the, of the systems. I, it, it's a role that lets me stand back and say, all right, I'm not like this to the work. I can see how the whole thing runs. I can't see another purpose for management other than to create and sustain and improve systems. So if people do the maintenance, then there's no role for management. If people have got, are given the time to step back and understand the whole system, yeah. But there are, there are not, that can't work in, not in all organisations. Some organisations, yes, not all organisations can work like that. And a lot of that is down to existing culture and not necessarily a first principles design. 
This is a different definition of management from I tell you what to do, by the way. That's not management in my way of doing it. Right, so we observed previously, <coughs> sometimes you need higher up, more authority, help to do that. Hmm. Those things may be linked. So, we have rapid resolution that we want to do. We know that we can do that better if we manage to have a flow of fixing stuff. We know that improving the system, which flow is, that's a job for management and it's a leadership behaviour. And having leadership working effectively depends on culture. And if you get leadership and culture working powerfully, effectively, doing the right things, then you have many better things re result in that. So where do we start? Well, Kata thinking says it is easier to act your way into new thinking than think your way into new acting. Certainly work from where you start. If you already believe stuff, then it will, of course, drive your behaviour. But if you don't yet believe it, trying to change your thinking overnight is really hard. But if you behave in a certain way, yes, it's fake it till you make it. Um, if you want to, oh, I've forgotten where I, it might have even been Neil Gaiman. Um, if you want to be wise, find somebody who's wise and behave like them. And eventually, those beliefs, those way, that ways of thinking become part of who you are and actually form part of your culture and your belief system. So, if we have this, where are we going to attack it? We can't directly hack culture. Be nice, but we can't. We can only hack behaviour. Um, there's a great book on creating a lean culture, David Mann's book, that says one of the powerful ways to do this is to improve leadership behaviours. And he, he gives four things that work very powerfully um, to, to do that. Standardised work for leaders, visualisation everywhere, a real daily process. So really building those habits because we do it every single day. We build the muscle memory of we do stuff in a disciplined way that takes discipline. And the way you can do all of those is you define a lean management system that has all of this stuff in. So, that's my second hypothesis that says um, we have a lean management system that will help us derive culture, that will help us improve the system, that will give us better flow, faster resolution of impediments. So, moving on through the method. Here's my experiment. We have our flow with our rock <coughs> causing turbulence. We have a cross-functional team who are working in that product flow, doing, doing the work. And yes, they visualise their work, yeah, and they talk about it every day, and they make very sure that they visualise impediments within that. Look, there's an impediment on, um, on pink sticky on, on one of the pieces of work. Okay, so this is business as usual. This is my, this is my control group. This is what's happening anyway, and there may be many of these teams. Let's try something. And the thing we try is we say to managers, get out your office, go and see. So here's my manager. And he's going to, he or she is going to go to where the work is happening. It's deliberately a low bravado, safe to fail experiment that says, dear managers, all I'm asking for you is about 15, 20 minutes a day. And it's deliberately designed to be low impact, avo to avoid, um, uh, avoid trying the patience of the organisation. Another little observation I'd like to make is this is the polar opposite of Scrum of Scrums. This isn't saying, yeah, when you can't fix something, you throw it upstairs and hope somebody catches it. This is saying to managers, you go to where the work is. Don't expect the problems to come to you. You go and find it for yourself. Understand the reality of where the, the people are doing the work. Okay. So, 
we are saying to managers, go and see, and we are saying to them, this is, this is true for every level of management. If you only have one level of management, fantastic. The organization I'm currently working in, I can think of about four levels, and that's not bad for the size that it is. But we are saying to every level of management, every day you will spend 15, 20 minutes with a working team. So your immediate line manager you might see most days. Your CTO you might see once every couple of years, depending on the size and the geographical distribution and so on. But it's saying to managers, you have the discipline every day, go and see. See what the work is, see where the problems in are. And then we also change your behavior a little bit. We stop you being command and control, telling people what to do managers, and we're trying to turn you into coaches. So if I'm the manager and I've gone to see, and I see somebody with, um, with an impediment, they, can't, they don't perceive they can fix themselves, I have a structured dialogue with them. So first, I make sure that, every, that, that we have a shared understanding of the context. What is the priority here? What are we trying to do? What is this impediment hurting, some of which you might not be able to see? And if I've seen the same thing over there last week, last month, last year, that might be useful. So the thing I bring as, as somebody who has more, more breadth is I understand context better. Fine, so let's share that. You describe your reality to me. What's the problem? What's the pain it's causing you? I might have some clarifying questions about that. And I'm absolutely going to make sure that this is well enough documented that when I walk out of here, I'm still going to understand it. And when I say document, if it's more than A5, it's probably too much at this point. We're talking simple, clear, capture the essence, not boiling the ocean, I don't want a slide deck like this. A5, good enough, an index card's worth. And then I, as a manager, I tell you, this is what I'm going to do about it. I give you a promise. I'm not just going to say, well, I, I feel your pain, you're empowered. I'm going to help you because you asked me for help. And that's the thing about all helping relationships, is they're based on a request for help. You've asked me to help you. Why would I say no to that? <coughs> so even if that's just helping you understand, no, this really is in your power. You perceive that you can't. OK, maybe a little confidence is what you need. But maybe you do need my support. Right, maybe you can't get that team over there who need to cooperate or collaborate with you to, to get this fixed. OK. So we go together. We take your impediment and we walk it over to that other team. And we say, so, hey, what about this? But I'm there supporting the person who, who, who owns it. I'm not doing it for them. I'm merely giving them some sponsorship and maybe just some support, some, some confidence in saying, yeah, OK, you can have this conversation and it's OK to have. And because you now understand the context of the problem, you can be really confident about this is the impact, the overall impact. Of course, some things may not be that simple and may require, may impact other parts of the organization that, that really, okay, you really need my help. And maybe you, while your information and your voice is helpful, actually, I need to take this. So... You might say, well, there's, there's a, hey, it worked. Um, the, the, there, is a, um, a, there is a management layer that I need to tell about this. Some of the people in my team are experiencing this, and I know this hurts because. So you take it to them. And they may have information coming in from, from, from other parts of the organization. In fact, they will. And that will be a prioritization discussion because we can't fix everything, all the problems, at the same time, probably. So, limiting our work in progress, what's the most important, what's the highest cost of delay, what do we need to fix now, and what can be um, prioritized to be done later? And that might happen at a number of, number of layers. And um, it's significant, though, that the information just doesn't disappear off. There's a feedback loop. Part of the promise you make um, to 
the person who's, who's experiencing that impediment is, I will come back and tell you what happened. Hopefully that will be with a, and we fixed it by. Of course, it may also be, uh, yeah, the, because this other thing had higher priority and we can only fix a certain amount at the same time, it may be not quite so good news. But um, there's certainly a commitment to come back because, not least, you have this regular thing that says we go around and we talk to all the working teams. We will come back and talk about this. You will find out what happened. And I did this in the wrong order, but hey, the, 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 um, there may indeed be multiple levels of this that go all the way up to you know, board level or, or whatever it is. So how often should we do this? Well, your frequency of doing this directly impacts your response time. So if you're, you're, you're working team meeting, yeah, that happens every day, that's great. But if the, um, if the next level up, um, sorry, is, is we're talking you know, daily and weekly, great, that's frequently. If it's weekly and monthly, then your um, service time is significantly reduced. But the organization that we saw this working in, it's a manufacturing organization, but they rotate their managers between manufacturing and business and technology. And when people have come from the shop floor and they see um, software delivery and they think, oh, hang on, this is about queues. I recognize some of these problems. They use the same disciplines. They can get an impediment from the shop floor to the CEO, and it's a very large company, in one day or less. Because this cadence happens in as many layers as it needs to every day. Okay, I'm kind of done there, except kind of one more thing. What do you do afterwards? Okay, so I'm going to try this again. Stand back. I'm going to try... No! Alchemy! <laughs> so, alchemy, what do we do with alchemy? We turn lead into gold. Right? So we have some, some stuff that's painful. No value. Things we'd rather... Oh, gold, I've gone too far. Um, that rather not have. Impediments. I'm going to turn those into gold. And the gold R is improvements. Where do you get your improvements from? Do we have suggestion boxes? This is one I, 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 I took a picture of in a customer a couple of weeks ago. Notice it's empty. <laughs> it's not just that they empty it frequently, it's that I've, it's often empty, because I walk past it several times a day. Here's another team. This is their board. Yes, they have impediments. They're all marked with pink stickies. Good, good, good. What happens when they've, they've resolved an impediment? It goes to the old impediment section which is the input for the next letter of improvements. And what actually this organization doesn't, but others do, is they categorize them, and they build a nice Pareto chart. And simply by the number of stickies, they know the things that keep on happening. So they know what's the most significant thing. So they say, well, we'll work on our priority um, improvement next time round is the thing with all the stickies on. Lead into gold. And we did it by capturing data, analyzing it, learning, experimenting. <coughs> oh crap, that's science. So, that's me really done this time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we have maybe seven or eight minutes for questions. That you highlighted how some impediments are uh, unresolved dependencies. Yes, that often happens. Yes, and they work. In the, they have the same similar impact. Yeah. And <coughs> so the, the question is two phased. And the first one is, uh, in your experience, how much, how many of those dependencies are unresolved dependencies, or how many are exceptions or other things that <coughs> are not dependencies? But it, it doesn't matter whether. 
where they came from. Sorry to repeat the question for the tape. How many of the, question, how many of, um, the impediments are, are um, dependencies and how many of them are exceptions? It doesn't matter. They all stop you doing the thing you want to do. They act as if they were dependencies. You can't plan for them, or maybe you can, but they're hard to, harder to plan for because if you could have planned for them, you would have planned for them. But they block you from doing the thing you need to do to have the, the product flowing. The second side is, is, is exactly about <coughs> that is do you feel like maybe some more traditional planning that highlights the dependencies could make those types of uh, impediments go away? Or should we do okay. that or should we resist? Can, can we plan to avoid um, impediments? Yes, it's called risk management. Stuff that we think might happen, we're not sure, there's a probability of it. The, high, the most likely, most impactful stuff, and again, it's a constrained work in progress prioritization game, Let's have plans just in case. Let's not boil the ocean, but let's have plans so that we don't have to spend um, you know, three months going, oh, what do we do about this when it happens? Oh, we've got a plan for that, fine. Roll the plan. Do you see a place for gun charts? Uh, very, it depends on your organization and it depends at what level of detail. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've written on Gantt charting before, and that's more time than I currently have. But happy to talk about it in the break. Yeah. Well, I, I think my question is related, because um, we're using pin stickers for short blockers, which may be impediments, I think. Mean, yeah, kind same of, thing, different name. Um, but, but specifically, where we have a dependency on another team or another mm -hmm. part of the organization, it's, and that, that may be entirely predictable, it may, you know, it's like we need the data analyst or we need the UX uh, mm. guy to sign off on something. The flow is stopped because we have a dependency on someone. Mm. Um, and it's not necessarily, it's not, it's not necessarily an impediment in this way. And I'm just wanting you to tell me with my hand down. No, I, I don't think so at all. I think it, it you know, really does strongly visualize it. It strongly lets you understand it, that it's blocking the flow. Um, you could say perhaps we started this piece of work too early if we know that we're going to have to wait at this point. So I, I think it's also related to what uh, Dave Anderson talks about in terms of balancing mm. Kanban system where an, another team is involved and they're expected to be involved, but if the, if the balance isn't right, there's the flow stops. And yes, uh, and I think that's right. And when you see it happening systemically, time and time again, then you start saying, well, maybe there's something we need to actually change in the way we work here. Yeah. In your experience, when this has been brought in, where you write this, um, have you found that teams are less likely to try and solve the problem themselves, or do they just preserve, they'll still continue to solve the problem they can solve, but just the best way to um, I don't have enough variation of trying it to really answer that. I do know the organization that I'm working with that this actually started with some ideas for, to help them. Um, they'd already done the you are empowered um, thing first and I thought well that's helped us but it's also hurt because now we can't get any help. Um, so I think it is a balance and it may be not be the where you start. You maybe want to start with the empowerment message. I've been just been told two minutes so it takes leadership, it takes commitment, it takes discipline, and at the end of the day, it may take some authority. So the product development unit I'm working with, the very top person of about those 1,400 people is absolutely committed to improvement, to a learning organization, to flow, to doing the right thing. So as with anything, it's stakeholder management. And yeah, at some point you have to say to people, this is what we're doing now. But we are working very strongly on saying, look, okay, we have one vertical slice through this who are doing the experiment, and we are using the results for that to say to other vertical slices through the chain, look, see how much this helps. And I think is that, yeah, that's us for time. Thank you very much.
Gracias, Tupi.